I were to sit down and I want to do some meditation, let's just say three minutes of meditation, there's good evidence that even three minutes of meditation can be beneficial for a variety of things, including enhanced focus and enhanced anxiety management. Let's say I sit down and I notice that I can really focus inward on what's happening at the level of my skin and my internal organs. And I can rule out everything. Maybe that's because the room is quiet or maybe it's just because my brain is in a state that I'm particularly good at that at that moment. Or maybe it's just a natural ability. Well, then I would opt for a three minute meditation practice in which I deliberately exterocept that I build up the circuitry to focus on something external to me because I want, and I think most people would like to have an adaptive mechanism within them so that they can slide along that continuum and they don't default to whatever it happens to be easiest for them in that moment. Now, if I were to sit down and try and focus on what's going on internally and I kept getting distracted by things happening outside of me, opening my eyes or feeling like I need to reach for my phone or paying attention to the sounds in the room, well, then I would actively engage a meditation practice, in this case, a three minute example, but it could be longer, where I'm deliberately trying to focus my perception on events at the level of the confines of my skin and internally. Why do I say this? Well, you know, I love to use the phrase uh, anytime with kids, uh, you know, when they say this is really hard or something's challenging or adults will say that's really tough. Well, as my graduate advisor used to say, that means you're learning. If something were easy, if you can perform any activity or thought, et cetera, well, then there is absolutely zero reason for your neural circuits to change. It's the friction, it's the feeling that something is hard that turns on the enormous variety of mechanisms at the level of cells, et cetera, that allow you to potentially change your neural circuitry. So challenge and discomfort is the signal to your brain and body that something needs to change. So I'm encouraging you to embark on meditative practices that are not your default. Okay, to essentially go against the grain of where your interoceptive bias or your extraoceptive bias happens to be at a given moment. So that brings us to a tool, and it's a tool that any and all of us can use, whether or not you tend to be interoceptively dominant, right, that you tend to pay more attention to your bodily sensations, or extraoceptively dominant. And again, if you don't know the answer to that question, there's a simple test that you can do. You can just sit down or lie down, close your eyes, and you can ask yourself or assess whether or not your attention tends to fleet to things outside of you, right? Cars honking or going by, people in the room, or whether or not you tend to be able to focus on your internal landscape to the exclusion of exteroception and attention to things outside the confines of your skin easily. Now, of course, this will depend on context and situation, even how well rested you are, et cetera, but that's exactly the point. This is the sort of thing you want to do every time you decide to do a meditation practice. In fact, I would suggest that you use this to determine what meditation you do at any given moment. So let's say you are somebody who is a regular meditator, or let's say you're somebody who's never meditated and you'd like to develop a meditation practice. I suggest that you do a test of whether or not you are more interoceptively dominant or exteroceptively dominant in that moment. Okay, this, again, this is not a personality trait. This is a question about where you happen to be in a moment. So let's say you're on a plane or you're in the car. If you're in the car, please don't close your eyes while driving. That's sort of obvious, but do this in a safe way, please. But stop, close your eyes, and assess whether or not you can access and focus your attention primarily on your internal state or whether or not your attention and perception gets pulled to something external, to exteroception. And again, that will vary depending on circumstance and who you are. Then I suggest opening your eyes and trying to focus your attention to something external to you and seeing or evaluating the extent to which you can divorce your perception from sensations that occur at the level of your skin or internally. Now, I should say that there's no technology, at least not that I'm aware of, absence of fMRI machine, in which case you are inside an fMRI machine while you do this. But unless you are in that experiment, and most of us aren't, there's no technology that can tell you, for instance, whether or not you are interoceptively dominant or extraoceptively dominant and whether or not the ratio is you know, 75 to 25 or what have you at any given moment. You have to assess this subjectively. However, if you sit down, for instance, and you notice that you can equally split your attention between internal sensations and external sensations or whether or not you find yourself pulled into external sensations when you're trying to focus inward or you find yourself pulled inward when you're trying to focus outward, well, that will dictate the sort of meditation that you perhaps ought to perform in that moment. Let me give an example of how you would do this. You would stop in some way, so sit or lie down, close your eyes and evaluate whether or not you can essentially rule out or eliminate attention to all outside events. 
most people won't be able to do that entirely, but try and focus your attention, for instance, on your breathing or the typical third eye center, you know, focusing at a spot right behind your forehead. If you feel you can do that reasonably well to the exclusion of what's happening around you, well then an important question arises. Should you meditate in a way to enhance that interoceptive awareness? Or rather, should you meditate in a way, for instance, with your eyes open and your attention on a particular portion of the landscape you're in, like a tree or, or maybe even a, um, you know, an object or a plant or something else in your immediate environment? to try and cultivate or enhance your exteroceptive awareness. That's up to you, but my bias would be one in which you work against your default state. Again, the default mode network is where you land on this interoceptive exteroceptive continuum is going to lead to more mind wandering. Whereas when you encourage, or we could even say force yourself a little bit to anchor your attention to either inside your body or outside your body, and you make that decision according to what you are doing less easily, well, then you are actively training up the neural circuits. You are engaging so-called neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to change in response to experience. You are deliberately engaging a shift along that continuum. And again, this will change. For some of you, this will change across the day where early in the day, you are very, very good at doing an interoceptive biased meditation. And later in the day, you aren't. I actually believe based on the data that I've covered, and we'll get into a few more papers about this, and my lab is actively working on this as well, that a meditative practice can be made far more effective. That is, it can invoke more neuroplasticity, more shift in brain states and brain circuitry if we do not take the easy path. That is, we go against the grain of what our brain would naturally do in a given moment. So if you're in a crowded airport and you're finding that everything's very distracting, well then, that would be a great time to do some interoceptive focused meditation. Whereas if you are really in your head, you know, you're looping thoughts about the past and present, maybe you're even in obsessive thought, well, that would be a terrific time, an ideal time really, to do a short meditation focused on something external to you. In both cases, whether or not you're focused on interoceptive bias or exteroceptive bias, you are going against, or I should say you're pushing back against your default mode network. I would argue it's going to be far more effective that is, you're going to reduce or shift the activity of that default mode network far more and in a far more beneficial way if you actively try and suppress your bias toward being more interoceptive or exteroceptive. Now, I think that's immensely beneficial both for the immediate changes that you experience, what others have called a state change, because that's what it is. And it also can lead to, as we referred to earlier, more neuroplasticity, more changes in the brain circuits that underlie your default mode network and lead to what are called trait changes. Now.